You're listening to TFM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners' discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field, and we'll look forward to seeing you there. Hey, everyone. I'm Rod Roddenberry, and you're listening to Trek FM. these books i thought i'd take some light reading in case i got bored well hello and welcome to tfm's local books and comic show for star trek and i am just one of the hosts here matthew rushing and hanging out with me in quirk's bar at deep space nine is the one and only casey pettit how are you man I am good. It's always good to be hanging out in Quark's bar. Any chance I get to visit Deep Space Nine, I am there. Yes, yes. Well, and I'm glad that I've got enough Quark's bucks for us to be drinking the good (laughs) stuff tonight instead of just the regular old synthahol. So do you think I can use those anywhere else or are those just here at Quark's? Mm, I well, you know, uh, I think those only work. Yeah, Quark's. (laughs) um, But I mean, you know, we've got franchises everywhere now. So, franchises everywhere exactly which is fantastic um well uh, before we dive into everything we've got some uh, great news items to talk about and then we're going to be talking about warped which is i think one of the very few deep space nine hardcover books but it was also the first deep space nine hardcover book so we're excited to be covering that this week Before we get into it, though, uh, of course, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. We would really appreciate uh, you going over to uh, Apple Podcasts. Give us a star rating review. Five stars is always great. But if you got some thoughts on the show, we would love to hear it. We also read those reviews out on the show. You can make sure you're subscribed wherever you're listening to this. So that way you'll get the shows as soon as they drop. You can also find us on Twitter at Trek FM. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek FM. We're on Instagram at Trek FM. We've got a listeners only discussion group so you can join listeners from all over the world talking about the different shows here. And of course, Trek.FM where you can see all the shows that we are doing. And then if you would like to help the network, like our associate producers here, Casey Pettit, as well as Greg Rosier, you can go over to patreon.com slash Trek FM and become part of our team. We're Actually, lower than we'd like to be support-wise to make sure the network keeps coming to you each and every month. So help us out. Go to patreon.com slash trekfm and become part of the team. Well, Casey, we do have a couple of comics that have uh, been released since the last time we recorded. And one of them is Lower Decks 2. And so we have a continuation of the story where, you know, you had the... bridge crew they are on uh, the planet they're uh, dealing with some aliens who are wanting to burn them at the stake uh, as witches <laughs> and then you've got of course our lower decks crew which is dealing with this uh, creation that they've made in the hollow deck and you know I, to me again this just feels like an episode. I'm I'm actually so surprised that they're wasting this <laughs> on a comic and 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 not just making this an episode because it, it feels so good. So yeah, I I would love to see a lower decks novel. I don't know exactly how that would work, but the comic is such a good medium for this and yeah like you said they're I, I feel like they're wasting material. I, I want to see some of the stuff on screen. The, the stuff with Dracula is just super wacky, um, which is, I guess, what we come to expect from our lower deckers. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, just the, the style of this, the, the craziness of the story. It's, um, you know, kind of like last time. I, I feel like this is one that uh, if you're a fan of lower decks, you should really pick this one up and read it. Um, it is a continuation of the first one, though. It's not like kind of the standalone 
uh, stories that we're getting on the show. So, um, but I don't think it's going to waste anybody's money or time picking these up and reading them for sure. Yeah, I, I think the greatest thing about this is that if if you love Lower Decks, this is literally just Lower Decks in a comic form, which, you know, as we mentioned last time, it, it feels so legitimate uh, to just what Lower Decks is as a show anyway because it's animated. And uh, this is also one where... It, it, I feel so strongly about this. Like, I don't really want to talk about the details of it because it's just more fun to read. And specifically since there's so many little details in this when, you know, you're reading the page at the very bottom of the page and some fine print, there is commentary about what's happening on a lot of these pages, which is just hysterical. And so, you know, it's they're they're taking what works on lower decks on screen and translating that to the comic book page and then finding things that would really only work in a comic Mm -hmm. that add to something that you you feel like fits within the lower decks star trek universe so i mean i just give them a lot of credit for for doing this and and i couldn't honestly recommend this more it's it's one of the I would say best Star Trek comics that I've read recently because it just feels so in tune with everything that the show is itself. Yeah. And there's so many little Easter eggs, even within these comics, you know, they're putting them in the shows they're putting them in here. Um, And and I mean, even just down to the details of this comic, like there's one point where um, Mariner's holding up a pad with some instructions on how to test for sentience on it. And if you're, reading it on an iPad like I am, you can zoom way in and see, and you can read what these steps are for sentience. And it's just, you know, they didn't overlook anything when they're doing this. And I think it's just such a, a great homage to the show. It's a great, I mean, we're two issues in and, you know, we both love these so far. So, you know, I, I, I think they, I, I just can't see what, I can't wait to see what they do with these going forward. Yeah. I, I, could not agree with you more. So, yeah, I mean, this is a huge recommend for both of us. And um, I'm really interested to talk to you about the next comic that came out, which is Star Trek number one. Uh, and this is the beginning of a brand new series, as we talked about last time, as we we're mentioning what their thought process is, which is this is almost like Star Trek Avengers. We're going to bring some of the best characters from Star Trek together to go on a mystery and you know uh, this is one this is not a cop-out but i don't want to talk too much in detail about this because i really do think if you haven't read this comic uh, you don't want this spoiled for you i think it's better to be read but there are a couple things that i did want to talk to you about which is we've both read you know the the lit verse and you know been very much marinated in especially what happened to Cisco when he came back. So I really am interested in your opinion of how this works uh, for you with Cisco returning so that we can go on this specific mission with this, you know, motley crew. Well, not even motley crew, but I mean like yeah. really interesting crew of characters from around the Star Trek universe to hunt for some god killers. Yeah, this was I I had to very quickly remind myself this is separate from the lit verse that we've read. Um, this is, I think, taking place like three years after the events of what we leave behind. And I think, I don't know, I, I'm kind of of two minds on it because I always love seeing Cisco come back. Um, I'm not sure, I guess, yet how I feel about how they brought him back because there's this kind of mystery, the, you know, this mission that they're going on. And so to me, it's kind of like I, I can't say if it's worth it to bring him back yet uh, until I see what this mystery is and and how he interacts with the crew. Because it's I mean, even this first issue really is just kind of a, a mystery in itself. Like he comes back, but he's he's got this word in his mind this this place that they have to go and and he can't he can't even go meet his new daughter or his three-year-old daughter at this point i guess uh, until he settles his mind on this issue um 
you know, and it's so, and then also reading this, I read this after we I finished reading Warped. So that was also kind of an odd juxtaposition of reading an early DS9 story versus mm-hmm. something that takes place after. So I don't know. The jury's still out for me on this one. I am, I am excited to get into this series to see where it goes. Um, and I mean, it's Cisco and, and some other, other not so motley crew, as you said. Right. Yeah, it is a couple of interesting things for me. Uh, one is that this takes place before Nemesis so that we can have data here. So that's very interesting um, before he, you know, meets his, his end. And, you know, I, I'm a little bit different in the sense that to me, if you were going to bring Cisco back, this, this is the way I want it to happen. Because instead of just pretending like, which is basically what we end up really doing uh, in the lit verse, is just taking away and stripping away everything that makes him special, taking away his, you know, uh, godhood, basically, and, and mm-hmm. pretending like that didn't really matter. You know, this makes all of that matter, you know, and it, it feels uh, like a, a really interesting connection to everything that Deep Space Nine built into the character and where we want to take him, that we're going to bring him back from the prophets. And now the reason that he's back is because he has to save the gods of the galaxy because of what's going on. And I just, I appreciate that so much more. And even, you know, you mentioned the idea of him not even get to see Rebecca You know, this fits very well with the Cisco that we know from the series, which is he's one who can become a little bit obsessive, especially when it comes to these type of things. Um, And so all in all, I mean, this issue really did it for me. Um, And it made me very I have I've honestly not been this excited about a Star Trek comic in a very long time. Um, And partly because I feel like they're actually telling a story that has a really interesting why to it, which is the most important thing when you're telling the story. What is the why? This why is fascinating to me and it involves characters that I love and I can't wait to see where they go with it. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you kind of brought all that up about Cisco and how they treated him in the lit verse because that that is kind of something that. I didn't really forget about, but I, you know, I, I do actually, um, I agree that, you know, it, it seemed like in the lit verse, the way he got brought back was just that Vaughn kind of just found him and then he's back and lives life, but gets restless. So goes back to being a, a starship captain or whatever. And at least here, like you said, he's still, even though he's lost his connection to the prophets, there's some, something he still has to do in that role as, the emissary essentially, which is what made what one of one of the things that made him such a fascinating character. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that was kind of something that would had kind of slipped my mind, I think, as I read it. Well, I'm I'm very excited to see where this goes. Um, you know, I, 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 I so quick question then for you. Say you were going to, you know, give this a rating out of one to five, you know, how would you rate this as the start of this new, you know, Star Trek comics adventure? Um, I think I'd actually probably give it a five just because this is not anything what I expected. You know, when you see when we've seen the cover with Cisco and Data and Crusher and whoever all else, you know, there you, you got to kind of wonder how they do it. But this one issue does a really, really good job of setting the stage for what's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. And the characters that are there don't, they didn't really feel jammed in there. Like they were like, it, it, it'd be hard to imagine this taking place like on a television episode, even a crossover event, but right. at the same yep. time, it it made sense for the story they're telling. It's not like they just all, it's not like Worf and, you know, any of the movies where these <laughs> right. people were all just kind of there. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a great point. Uh, I, I think I would agree with you. I, I would probably give this a five as well. Uh, and mainly just because 
it, I mean, you had my curiosity, but now you have my attention, you know? (laughs) Uh, And so I'm, I'm all for this and I can't wait to see, you know, where this goes next. And so, well, I love that uh, we're going to jump from this new comic uh, to the very first Star Trek and Deep Space Nine hardcover novel. So let's get warped. Casey, this book takes place very early in uh, Deep Space Nine. Uh, In fact, it would take place probably at the very beginning, basically, of uh, season two or maybe between season one and season two because this uh is supposed to have taken place before the circle trilogy Mm -hmm. and so i think one of the biggest questions that i kind of came away from this book with for you because i was i couldn't wait to hear what you had to say about it was how do you feel like this fits in the series with the story that they're telling and where it's supposed to be housed in the chronology (laughs) <laughs> I, it's really interesting. I, I feel like this book and this author were ahead of their time for Deep Space Nine. Um, cause, uh, just as a standalone, like, I don't think it fits where it's set. I actually think if they had the foresight to put this a couple seasons in the future, kind of when the series itself got a little darker, it, it probably would have fit better because this book has very dark themes, very dark themes uh, in it. And not, you know, Deep Space Nine was always kind of the darker Star Trek. It was a little bit uh, rougher. You know, we actually started seeing confrontation between our characters and, and things like that. But it's still in those first couple seasons was – kind of the bright, shiny Star Trek in some ways that we're used to. And this story itself is has such a darkness to it, like as far as the tone of the story, that it, it seems like it would fit more in season five, like season five, six, even during the Dominion War, as kind of a, a side quest almost of our characters. Um So as a Deep Space Nine story, I think it it fits very well. Between seasons one and two, I'm not sure that it fits so well. The, uh, mm-hmm. it, like I said, I just feel like it was ahead of its time. Yeah, I think that's that's a really valid take, and it is definitely something that myself uh, I ended up struggling with. And so to try and rectify that, I was I was really sifting the story through my mind through what ha- comes in deep space nine, especially in that second season with the circle trilogy. And this book even makes allusions to the, uh, idea that, you know, the, the Cardassians have other irons in the fire with ways to have an influence on deep space nine and its politics. And this actually helped me make sense of the idea that the Circle would gain prominence in Bajor because of the actions that happen on the planet. And that they, that what would come out about this would lead people to think that Bajor for the Bajorans is the way to go. And, you know, make Bajor great again was was going to be their slogan, <laughs> right? And so that's how I kind of, uh, and, and we'll talk more of, of I think, reasons why um, because of d- specific story points, but that's where I f- kind of was able to b- retcon in my brain that this story could fit with that because this is such a major upheaval for the Bajorans and the Bajoran people. And especially if it came out in any way that, you know, the Cardassians were behind this, uh, which they were um, in the sense that they were supporting our, our main villain here and this Bajoran coup that we get, that that would lead people to embrace the idea of the circle trilogy of the circle. And 
you know, a lot of what happens here on Bajor is directly coming from the lack of uh, the Kai being there mm-hmm. and the loss of, of the Kai. And so all of the machinations that are, you know, going into the, the Circle uh, series that we get and when wanting to be made Kai with that really also made sense too. So that that's where I kind of ended up being like, okay, I can see how this can work. But I think you made a great point, which is a lot of where this author goes does really tie into where the series itself goes, which is a, a very, very deep exploration of a lot of things like, you know, existence itself, you know, mm-hmm. what we believe about a reality, uh, you know, all of that stuff is is where we're going to go. So, yeah, it is an interesting connection between later Deep Space Nine and early Deep Space Nine. Yeah. Well, I think, too, that the the early seasons of Deep Space Nine, especially once you get into the Circle trilogy, really kind of focused on the Bajoran, um, the Bajoran faith, their government or lack thereof, you know, the provisional government, the... Uh, the transition from Kai Opaka to searching for a Kai and then later to Kai Wen. I mean, you know, like you said, like when we see the circle trilogy, we see this group kind of rise to power because essentially of a power vacuum that's happened, not only because they lost the Kai, but also they're re- still very recently out of the occupation. And so there's this huge power vacuum where, you know, these, um, different kind of factions are rising up and want their voices to be heard. They were all fighting against the Cardassians, but once the Cardassians go away, now all their old rivalries kind of come back to the surface. They've Everyone's got their ideas. And so, you know, from seeing something like in this story and then leading into the Circle Trilogy, you can kind of see where people are kind of there's tensions between uh, these different factions on Bajor. Well, and I think that leads us perfectly in the idea that one of the big story points that we get is this Bajoran coup that happens. Uh, and this general R, I think is how you would say his name, who's leaving this uh, severality front, which very strange name um, yes. has uh joined with a character that we come to know as McCoag and plans to basically make jo- Bajor for the Bajorans. But one of their biggest plans is they're going to take these uh, CI augmented hollow suites to create a financial boom for Bajor, which makes it independent, not needing anybody else. And this was just a really interesting thing to me because we see this general be able to overthrow the Bajoran provisional government because we know how weak it is there. Um, And just the idea that, okay, if we're not going to, you know, be looking to the Federation for help, we do have to find a way to make ourselves financially viable because, of course, Bajor at this point is, is very poor after what happened with the Cardassian occupation. And so kind of linking themselves with this person uh, for financial gain is just, it it was a really interesting story point. Yeah. And and a lot of interesting characters in here too, between general R and McHoag, who isn't even a Bajoran himself, but, um, you know, the use of this technology and really kind of um, diving into the sci-fi aspect of Star Trek and and exploring the use of holosuites and these augmented holosuites. Um, it, <laughs> you and I both have kind of talked before this, like this story was so dense and, you know, like even just the explanation of these holosuites uh, took a long time in the book, but at the end of the day, it was like a very clever story point. It's something we haven't really seen before. We haven't seen the Holosuites 
or holodex uh, on any other of the Star Trek series used in quite the same way. Um, they really got down into the, the nitty gritty on the science aspect of things. And, um, you know, they're the general and McHogue are essentially taking something that people like the recreational tool that a lot of people use and exploiting that, um, and, and starting on deep space nine, partly, I think just because there's an abundance of hollow suites there, this, um, uninhabited section, I guess, of the station where they discovered some new hollow suites, but, you know, this whole story itself was, I mean, that was really the impetus for the story is this, uh, this coup and building a new city on, on the planet and just basically enslaving the people, I guess, mm -hmm. to their hedonism, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I think one of the things that really fascinated me about this was, and this is where I thought the book was really smart, the struggle that Bajor had faced with the Cardassians had completely united them. And when that was no longer there, Bajor finds itself being divided because different Bajorans have different ideas on what's best for Bajor. And that's the difficulty, you know, uh, and, and I think... What was so beautiful about that is that's one of those really timeless themes of the idea that, you know, major struggle is something that brings civilizations together. And yet, when those are over, you are going to see these different factions pop up of different ideas of, okay, well, how do we move forward? And Bajor is in this place where... It's a lot of the people are finding the provisional government to be weak. They're frustrated that things are taking so long. And so then you get this general and McHogue who basically prey upon that to be able to take power. And, you know, they they also. They really prey upon this idea of. It's okay to do things that are morally dubious <laughs> yeah. for the greater good um, because the ends justify the means. And then, of course, all of Bajor finds itself in a, in a terrible, you know, uh, crap storm. Um, almost literally. <laughs> almost literally. <laughs> uh, almost literally, but that's close enough Be because of these actions and and I, I felt like this book was really doing something to which I find Deep Space Nine so good at doing, even as I continue to watch it today, is that it's relevant. And a lot of these themes seem to be so relevant because, you know, how many times have we seen in our world over the past 20 years of people being willing to do morally dubious things uh, because they're tired of things taking so long? You know, um, that the system is too slow, so we just need to overthrow it and start, you know, like all of these type of things really play into what's going on here on Bajor and what leads to all of these terrible problems. And um, I, I thought, you know, that's one of the things that Jeter was really, or Jeter, I'm not sure how they say their last name. Um, we'll say Jeter because then they're they're like the baseball player. Yeah. Um, really does a great job of, I think, taking, you know, the world in which we know from now past history and really picking up these these larger than life themes that oh, are, are so overarching for, you know, all time and utilizing them to tell a great story here. And so, yeah, I was I was really blown away by that. Well, and I think, yeah, taking this idea of the escapism that the hollow suites provide to people, and, and we have our own mm. ways of doing that now between TV and movies and video games and whatever, and um, you know, virtual reality and, you know, all these, mm -hmm. yes. the metaverse or whatever. <laughs> you can, yes. 
uh, you know, these kind of fictional worlds that you could go into and be a different person. And it's exploiting that escapism because these augmented hollow suites are turning people on deep space nine mm-hmm. into killers. Yes. And it's a, it's a slow burn for people until later in the story where they, they literally amp it up to where it, it doesn't take much, but you know, it's, it's just slow effect that it's having on the users of the hollow suites where once they've been indoctrinated or whatever by the, the mind control that's happening inside the hollow suites, they go on a murderous rampage, which, mm-hmm. you know, we're seeing some of the stories happen in the hollow suites of, and, and we come to find out McHogue is, is in there himself yes. and kind of prodding people along to do the things that they maybe wouldn't normally do. And we see it with mm-hmm. Jake Cisco, especially at the, at the beginning of the story, starting to, um, fall into this a little bit, although he's still early on and he's able to be strong and not act on those feelings, even within the hollow suite. Um, but others are not so fortunate and, and they're able to catch some people and, and, you know, discover this plot that then really propels the story forward on yeah. trying to find McHogue and, 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 what exactly he represents and and that i feel like is where you know once once our crew kind of found out what was going on it really kind of propelled that story forward and and made it a a good ride (laughs) well and and you bring something up that's really interesting because what mchogue is selling is a license of freedom and I would say his name really shouldn't be McHogue. It should be McLusion because he's delusional um, and that's what he's selling nice. to people. Uh, and he, what he is selling in his augmented hollow suites is this idea of libertinism, right? The idea that you can do anything you want. You can have anything you want. You can create your own reality and it can actually be reality. You can truly live your truth, whatever that is. Um, and the crazy thing about this CI technology is that it actually, the illusions become so intense that it begins to override, they say, the user's perception of reality itself. And, and this was just so fascinating to me because it is, in many ways, I think, the fact that this book is written so long ago and yet it is pinpointing a an issue to which we have today of the idea of people, you know, this is 1995, but pinpointing the idea that, that people would, would truly want to be able to create their own realities is, you know, fascinating here. But like you said, what they don't realize is that McHogue is actually put himself as God of this new reality. They, there's actually really no freedom outside what he wants. And so he's just someone who basically is repeating a lie long enough so people begin to believe it, you know? Like, he's tickling their ears, telling them what he wants to be, but really what he is is just a con man who believes himself to be God. And then in the end, he becomes a slave to his own desires, and so does everybody else who gets caught in in this technology. And it is just absolutely fascinating just how well this this thematic element and this plot element play out i think even more so in today's world than it did in 1995 yeah it did a really it did a good job of almost creating an existential crisis for yes a a lot of our characters that and and the way that it explained it, and even the way I think McHogan explains it, I think Bashir or Dax or somebody might explain it also at some point. But the fact that they actually lose the ability to determine what's real and what's not, and and especially towards the end of the story when Cisco is really experiencing that himself, um. But then even going further, they kind of contemplate like, well, 
okay, well, this is, uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to believe that this right here is my reality, but is it, are we still in a hollow suite? Are we still right. in this imaginary world? And it kind of creates this almost inception type, uh, kind of thought process, like a dream within a dream within a dream, you know, and how mm -hmm. deep can you go? Uh, yeah. You know, to the point where it even had some of those same themes of like how the further in you are, the slower the quote unquote real reality's time is moving. Um, because I think, uh, I can't remember who it was that went into the hollow suite that it, it was like seven and a half minutes. I don't know if that was Odo or if, uh, it was somebody else, but they said that they were in there. They felt like they were in there it's for Dax, hours. I believe. Or is that Dax? Yeah. yeah. And those, it, it got to the point actually where I, while I was reading the story, I started kind of wondering it, is what yeah. I'm, I feel like what yep. I'm reading is in the real world, but now I'm not sure. And that I think was, that was a very um, kind of tight rope to walk, I think, for the mm -hmm. author as far as um, keeping some of that mystery there, but also making a coherent story that we could actually follow you know, this mystery as, as the crew tries to figure it out. And I thought that was one of the really interesting, one of the best parts, I think, of the story for me was just this whole exploration of the reality versus non-reality. And you create your own reality, or is it just Mako whispering in your ear and um, kind of being the puppet master almost? And, uh, you know, I like you said, yes. what you said about telling you a lie long enough to where you're actually going to believe it. And again, I, I felt like as I was reading it, I'm like, am I being told a lie enough that yes, I'm believing it yes. as I'm reading the story? So yes. I thought that was a, a pretty good, a, a pretty good tool that this author used when telling mm -hmm. the story. I a hundred percent agree with you. Uh, I think that's a great way to put it to where the way that it's written, it can be sometimes hard to distinguish and I think that is a plus in the sense that it fits very well within the story because our characters themselves are also having a hard time with this. And this is this is something that I thought was really great because it really came down to the truth will set you free because, you know, McHogue is is a person who believes truth to basically be malleable. He can do this, right? He can create his own reality. And he thinks he understands what reality is. And yet Cisco is able to beat McHogue because he's actually done something that no other person has done. He's peeked behind the curtain and really seen reality in a way that nobody else has, which is basically from the viewpoint of a god, from the viewpoint of the prophets, which for all intents and purposes, of course, in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, are in the standpoint of gods. And the fact that in reality, the truth is far more complex than McHogue can ever have thought. You know, um, the truth for McHogue, and it's an inconvenient truth, is yes, Reality is much more complex, it's much more beautiful, it's much more wonderful, it's much more expansive than just any mortal can actually comprehend. Reality involves the metaphysical in a way that we can hardly even fathom. And in the end, the truth is the truth whether you believe it or understand it. And Cisco has some inclination of what that is because he's peeked behind that curtain. And... McHogue, you know, his delusions of grandeur and it, his desire for something to be true that don't actually comport with reality. I mean, like, you know, your metaverse is never going to be real. And he's basically trying to exchange the truth for a lie. And and this leads to this really interesting confrontation about the idea of what truth is and what is actually true and what's not and how what he's doing is and we'll talk about this in a second but there's there's this whole metaphysical spiritual side to what's happening that's having an impact on the material side of the world as well all because 
he wants to rewrite reality from his point of view. And what he doesn't realize is that it's so much bigger than what he thought possible. It's so much more amazing than what he thought possible. Why? Because reality involves the metaphysical and the physical. And that's hard for for materialists to understand. And that's what, again, this is where this book was like, oh my gosh, this feels like Deep Space Nine from like yeah. seasons five onward where we're really starting to get into you know, the ideas of the prophets and all that stuff. And this is the type of stuff that Deep Space Nine wrestled with so well. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. And I, I mean, you know, if told a different way, McHoag could have been a very tragic character in this. You know, we know from early on in the story that at some point in history, he was kind of a compatriot of quarks that they'd had dealings together. So we know already that he's kind of, uh, or we're told anyways, that he's always been kind of a nefarious person. And especially during the, those last confrontation, like the, the last confrontation between McHogue and Cisco, I actually did pity McHogue a little bit because you know, while he kind of went almost pure evil, uh, I don't know that that's truly who that character would have always been. Because I think for him, his truth was the illusion. You know, he had been doing this for so long and subjected to the um, the augmented holosuite technology, whatever that was, <laughs> that, that super tech techno babble stuff um that you know he, he you know he's you know we, we said a little bit ago like he's whispering in people's ears and telling them a lie but i think for him that is the truth now though he, yes. he's he's been telling himself those lies for so long and he's become drunk with this power mm -hmm. over everybody to where he's you know we've got this illusion he you know, for him, it's his reality because he is a god now to everybody within this illusion. And I think that's that makes his character tragic. What makes him not so tragic is in the end when he's taunting Cisco and then, you know, our hero Cisco, you know, like you said, he peeks behind the curtain. He knows he knows what kind of what the deal is with all this and everybody leaves a little piece of them inside this illusion and, and realizes there's this little boy that he had seen with, with Jake early on. And that little boy actually was McHogue and was more probably the true McHogue. And, um, you know, the, the way that the way that the author wrapped all of this stuff up again, it was, it was so dense, but it, it it was a lot to chew on, really, and uh, I think told a really, really good story. And, and, and like you said, this um, he—it's it, such a Deep Space Nine story. It's it's one of those stories that I would have actually loved to have seen something to this effect on the show at some point, where they really play with reality, not like in you know, dramatis personae or, you know, some of those other episodes where we, the audience can tell what's real and not, but, you know, kind of, you know, almost like the holodeck episodes where at the end of the episode, somebody's like a computer and program and nothing happens. And, you know, they, they can walk away feeling okay about it. You know, I, I think what you said there is, is, is so true. I mean, in the end, McHogue, had exchanged the truth for a lie. And I think you're absolutely right. He had, he was delusional by the end because he, he had bought the lie. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the most interesting things about this, and I kind of alluded to it, was the fact that there is a spiritual side to this in which, you know, um, the, the Kai visits... Cisco in in kind of a prophet like vision where they get to have a conversation about what's happening and how this goes beyond just the material universe. The fact that what's happening in the immaterial is now affecting the material specifically. It's warping reality. Um, 
And, you know, she had some really interesting quotes, and I'm, I'm going to read a, just a little bit because it, the way it's said is so fascinating. She said, There and elsewhere, in the worlds of falsehood and of the truth, the storms have unleashed their fury, and what you have been able to see so far is but the least of their wrath. And then she says later, It has another name, an ancient one that cannot be spoken, just as the evil it represents is an ancient one. Did you really think, Benjamin, that such things could not have been encountered before, although in a different guise? And so this idea that what's being waged here is this really spiritual battle and that what happens in the spiritual sense actually impacts the material sense that and the, and this is the thing that you know um the kai kind of helps explain to cisco that the desires that mchoag is awakening and people cannot be filled solely on this material world right what they're actually looking for in these hollow suites is something that is immaterial there's a spiritual side to this and because of that that battle between um basically good and evil this insatiable appetite this insatiable desire just for more this selfish desire for only what one wants at 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 the expense of all others is is warping reality and i just this to me blew my mind how deep this book was getting in the spiritual side of deep space nine here right before obviously the circle trilogy but also before you know deep space nine really i think dug into this um but at the same time i mean this feels like the discussion we are i mean when you season one ends with in the hands of the prophets where we're mm -hmm. having this ma major discussion between science and and spirituality and this book just kind of takes that idea and completely runs with it and says yeah it's 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 not as divorced as you would like it to be. In fact, they actually go together. Uh, and to me, that's that's another reason why I felt like this book really fit within the time period they were writing, because it does kind of pick up the subject matter of where we ended season one. That's a really good point, because especially in early in Deep Space Nine, Cisco himself is very much struggling with this. He does not want to be emissary. Yes. He is yes. very much like thinking from the Starfleet Starfleet ideals of science and wormhole aliens, and it's not till much later where he really accepts his position as emissary. And really, in this book, the 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 idea of the emissary never comes up. I don't even think we see that word anywhere. Um, but you know, like kind of, I'll, I'll see your your Kyle Paca quotes, and I'll raise you one here where she says. This being you call McHoag, he's an ancient enemy, one who wears this man's face as a mask, the better to deceive those who only see with their eyes and not with their hearts. And I think that's just another one that gets exactly to, to what you were just saying about even McHoag was seeing with his eyes, the, the people going to the hollow suites, they see something with their eyes. But what she's saying is like they really need to follow their hearts and they need they're they're looking for something deeper and you know kind of unfortunately in this story the the mass of people are are really led to McHoag and um it, it's Cisco who kind of has to to step back and kind of lead with his heart at, at the end of this and in order to get out of this illusion that he's in and and get back to reality essentially trapping McHoag in the illusion by himself and, and mm -hmm. freeing everybody yep. else. And you could say almost, uh, you know, fulfilling, not fulfilling, but, you know, uh, contributing to his role as emissary yes. uh, to the Bishop yep. I, I really like uh, you bringing up that quote there because there's, there's another part of uh, one of her quotes where she says, perhaps that is what the more foolish of your blood would call progress. That dizzying rush to potentate and to enlar enlarge that which was already dreadful enough before, which the way in which that quote nails the idea of the and, and I, I think that this book clearly is saying that 
what's at the heart of humanity and or all of the alien races we see is not good, but something that's more prone to evil. And that that to say that one can have absolute freedom with no consequences is foolish. And that it is already dreadful enough before the, that idea. And, and I think, too, that this, this, this whole thing really drives home what Deep Space Nine does, which is that reality is much more complex, it's much more beautiful, and it's much more uh, wonderful than we even thought possible. And because it does involve a material side and a spiritual side like and that's what deep space nine struggles with and wrestles with and that's what this book does too and just you know i i absolutely love it because you know um this is exactly what deep space nine does when it's at its best um it truly is making you think and so now I have a really interesting question for you, Casey, because one of the things that we've been doing right now is just, I, I think, legitimately singing this book's praises. Mm-hmm. But I, I can't say that I feel that this book is perfect. And the reason for that is what I feel is the voices and maybe even the writing style of the book is sometimes a hindrance. And so how do you feel, especially since this is a very early Deep Space Nine book, How does this book capture the voices of the characters for you? Does it? And is the writing style where we've called it out to be a benefit, is it ever a hindrance to you at all? Yeah. So (laughs) this is... uh, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I I do feel like we have been uh, just dumping praise on this book, which, you know, and rightly so, but... um, one of the things Star Trek books I feel like always struggle with is early on in their runs. And I would even say it for some of the recent, like for the new series too, like, like Discovery and in some ways Picard. But um, especially with these older ones, um, no, I, I don't feel like it really captures the voice of the characters. Um, or maybe I'd, maybe I'd say it's hit or miss. Um there were times where when I was reading this and it, it, there's even a historian's note at the beginning that says it takes place like just before the circle trilogy or, or between seasons one and two, it, it said something like that. So, so clearly season one at this point was done and actually season two was already going when that note was written. Um, but sometimes it felt like the author was just using the series Bible and not actually the episodes and the actual performances um, the, it, you know, cause it, it, so there was just some times where it just wasn't quite right. I actually kind of liked Bashir in this one cause he wasn't the, uh, womanizer he tried to be in early deep space nine, but mm-hmm. it's also not the Bashir that we knew at that time. Um, you know, as, as to the writing style, there was, uh, there was a lot of things like sick, like I said earlier that, that I liked, but, um, overall, um, this was a hard book to read. It, it was uh, beyond just the density of the story itself. Sometimes I felt like the author was uh, trying to prove to us how many words he knew or how like these big words that he could put in. And, and especially when he was putting them in the mouths of our characters, it just didn't make sense at all. Like there, there were certain things where I had to read a, read some things more than once just to understand what it was saying because it was just so I don't know verbose you know it's a very very literary style of writing you know if you're looking back at like Dickens or Tolstoy in some ways you know Mm -hmm. just like just very descriptive and overly descriptive I'd say at some points and um and then even times it you know it it'd take me out because there were sometimes it was It was like he was writing for somebody who had never seen Deep Space Nine before, so he was explaining things in text that we already knew about our characters from pretty early on in the series and didn't really need to 
um, describe so much like what a trill is or, you know, right. anything like that. So yeah, there was, uh, it was that, that those were the biggest struggles. I, I almost wish that the, once again, that this was written later and set later in the series, because I think it would have just sound a little bit better and fit better at that point. But mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so for me, this, this book almost never gets the characters voices, right. Um, and part of that is a lot of the vernacular that gets used for the characters doesn't feel like them at all. Um, it just, you know, it, one of the most important things about writing tie-in fiction is to get the sound of the characters' voices right, and it's it's in in many ways that's a metaphysical thing, uh, right? You know, you're you're trying to tap into the way in which these characters speak, the way in which they've been written, but more so the way in which that you could actually hear the actors delivering these lines. And that it sounds like them. So there's a cadence. There's a way that they talk. There's there's a vernacular that each one of them uses that is specific to them. And so I think you really nailed it when you said this feels like that they've been writing on the series Bible instead of having been, you know, just pouring over watching the different episodes as many times as possible to try and get that down. And so 100% this, this doesn't necessarily work. Uh, in that way, which is disappointing because this book would be absolutely perfect, I think, if that was the case. But also, you know, you did mention that there are some places where I think just the writing style itself becomes a little. Obtuse in ways that it doesn't need to be. Um, so a little bit more clarity and brevity in the writing and just uh, the uh, understanding of the story would just m help. In some places, I think that works. Where we talked about where, you know, obfuscating the the experience of the characters and what's real and what's not, that's great because that really helps mm -hmm. with the thematic element. But there are other places where, you know, a a word I don't have to look up uh, because it's not been used in English literature since, you know, 1875 would be helpful. Um, and so absolutely, I, I think that's one of the major downfalls, uh, you know, uh, of the book itself is that it just it really lacks the characterization of the Deep Space Nine characters in a way that truly captures their essence. And that is disappointing um, mm -hmm. because uh, and. Like you said, you know, that's one of the hard things about writing these stories when the series has only had one season and it, you didn't have, you know, DVR, you didn't have this replaying, you know, the way that it does now. You couldn't go to Netflix and rewatch the episodes a thousand times like, you know, I, I know that our Deep Space Nine authors, specifically somebody like... um uh, and and we just covered Una's latest book, you know, and and, and included a lot of Deep Space Nine references. I know that Una watches Deep Space Nine repeatedly. You mm -hmm. know, this author didn't have that, and so you know, I do cut them a little bit of slack, but I also feel like it is definitely you know a detriment to the story in the end. What would you, uh, given all that, rate the book? You know, we've we've praised the story. We've kind of knocked it down some for its writing. So where would you land on ratings? I would say that this book is still a four out of five stars. And and mainly because there's so much about this that captures the essence of what Deep Space Nine is, was, and would be from this time period. Um, it, the, I'm just going to take away that one star uh, for the characterization. But... You know, and I didn't know where I was going to land when I was in the middle of the book because there were those frustrations. Mm -hmm. But getting to the end of the story, the storyline was just so rich, so deep that I was I was like, yeah, that completely ameliorates many of the problems that I have with not completely hearing the voices of the characters the way that I would love to. So, yeah, that's where I end up. Where are you, Casey? Because, yeah, I know. Obviously, it seems like we've agreed on just about everything good and bad. 
where where did you land? Uh, you know, I, I I dinged it a little bit more than you. I'd say it's it's in the three to three and a half range, and, and a lot of it, 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 the writing style was really what what kind of did it for me. It yeah. it was really hard to slog through some of the kind of flowery, uh, you know, old timey big word writing yeah, um, yeah. I, could, I could forget i could forgive it some for the characterizations but um you know when it got to the point of it felt like the author just kind of um building himself up a little bit not not that they need to write down to star trek fans uh but no I there's understand. kind of a time and a place like, yeah and it, it's just i i think you you said it right where um th- they're it was it was good when it needed to be, but then other times it was like you know let's let's get to the point. Brevity is key here. Let's keep the story moving, and sometimes it really slowed it down. So yeah, so I'd I'd give it three or three and a half. Yeah, no, and and in all honesty, I can't fault you at all for that. I really can't. Um, I absolutely uh, understand that being the case, and you know. Just because of my personality, uh, you know, this thematic work was so strong, it could, let's just say the thematic work covered a multitude of sins uh, <laughs> when it came to the rest of the book. Um, but you're, I, I think you're 100% right there, you know, and, and so, you know, if I wasn't being more generous because of that, I probably would be at the three and a half, Um that 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 you're at and you know i um i i'm just i am definitely being overly generous and i'll just uh, uh freely admit that um but you know I, I think that's the thing is that a book can be far from perfect but it can still find a way to capture your imagination and man i just i do wish this book had just been written a little bit later um, where they had more time with the characters because I, I think this book could be one of the absolute best Deep Space Nine books and or Star Trek books ever. And yeah, it just, it isn't. Well, I just love diving into some of these older books, these hardcovers, the event novels. Uh, I know we got some more coming in the future. We got some other things coming up. Um but, you know, especially when we get a chance to go back and revisit Deep Space Nine, I just I love that opportunity. I feel like because the the novels, you know, hadn't been going as long as the original series or Next Generation, like they just didn't get a lot of novels to go. And um, I'm glad we've been able to continue that series after. But I also love just going back and, mm-hmm. and looking at some of these old ones, too. Yeah, no, I'm I 100% agree with you, man, and uh, I can't wait. In fact, I think we've got a really big treat for everybody coming up the next uh, episode. We're going to be talking about the making of book that just came out for First Contact, which you know we haven't talked about a nonfiction book here in a long time. But you know, this one came yeah. out, and both you and I were pretty excited about it, and thought you know this would just be a great episode for us to do. And so we're actually going to be bringing that out episode out a little bit. You know, earlier than we have been um, with uh, because, yeah, we just wanted to give you guys a little gift there. So we're excited to do that. But Casey, before we hit that, you know, if people want to catch up with you and see what else you've got going on, where would they find you? You can find me on social media at Knitting Trekkie. I'm on Goodreads, Letterboxd, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find me on Facebook and the Babel Conference. And you can find me doing another podcast called Mickey's Marvels where we talk about everything under the Disney umbrella. Man, you could find me all over uh, social media under the name Matt Rushing 2 So Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, Vero. You can also find me here, of course, on the network with a bunch of different shows. One is the 602 Club. It's our whole other side of the network where we do so much Star Trek. We like to talk about all the other fandoms we love. There's some great bonus shows in there as well, like Assembling Avengers or Snyder Cuts. You can also find me doing The Orb with Chris Jones, where we do talk about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Warp 5, talking about Star Trek Enterprise. Saddle Up is talking about Star Trek Strange New Worlds. And we've got The Artificial Tango talking about Star Trek Picard. Overall, on the Nerd Party Network, I've got two shows. One's completed, 
So you can listen to the entire thing now. It's called Owl Post. I did that with Drea Kaufman, and we talked about every single chapter of the Harry Potter series, one chapter at a time. And then last but not least, the great John Mills and I do Aggressive Negotiations, a Star Wars podcast. And until next time, live long and read on. You call that light reading? To each his own, number one.